artists, mechanics, and even rock climbers all have tools created and customized for their professions. Now without these tools, it would be impossible for them to do their jobs efficiently. Now, all of us need the right tools to be efficient, and these are the tools of our trade. Now, these fundamental tools are going to tell us the story of how machining gets done. So stick around for volcanoes, lasers, and end mills in this Haas Tip of the Day. When we get a brand new Haas CNC mill and we are pulling off that plastic for the very first time, it is a beautiful thing. But this brand new machine is like a bare kitchen in a new home. It would be hard to make a meal on our first day in that home without a trip to the home improvement store and the supermarket for a significant supply run. We would need much more than just milk and eggs. Look, a lot can go into tooling up a new machine. So we figured we would show you the list we came up with, tell you why we made the choices we did and get your input along the way. Many of the parts we cut will follow the same basic operation plan. Face, profile, drill, tap, ream, engrave, and chamfer. We'll flip the part and face, mill, drill, tap, ream, maybe a little 3D contouring, and chamfer. We will follow some common rules when selecting tools for any particular job. In general, we are matching up, pairing our tools and our tool coatings with the material that we intend to cut. Now, in the same way that a sommelier might pair a red wine with red meat, or a white wine with fish or chicken, we pair harder coatings that can maintain their wear resistance, even at high temperatures, with tough materials that generate a lot of heat, like alloy and stainless steels. We choose uncoated polished tools or coatings with good lubricity to pair with softer materials, like aluminum, that don't generate a lot of heat when cut, but they tend to stick to our tools. It's always a balance between a tool's hardness, its thermal stability, and its lubricity. Some of these tool coatings can maintain their hardness at incredible temperatures. It's this hardness that can lend to great wear resistance. This aluminum chromium nitride coating can maintain its hardness at temperatures above 1100 degrees Celsius, about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we are talking about volcano level temperatures. An incorrect pairing of tool and material can, can leave our tool overheating or the tool can gall up, a lack of thermal stability or a lack of lubricity. Yeah, some coatings and tool materials are very hard, but only up to a certain temperature and then they break down quickly. The faster a tool spins, the more heat it generates. And if you're running on steels or nickel alloys, things can heat up fast. Having a coating with a higher heat stability is like putting a fireproof suit on our tools. On aluminum, we don't have to worry about heat as much, but we do have to keep an eye on our tools lubricity. These are not the kind of tools that we will find in our local hardware store. Okay, we might find some of these tools, kind of. Drill bits might be the only tools on this table that your average person on the street would recognize, but these are not your average hardware store drills. We are looking for versatility, precision, and value in a starter drill bit set. Now for a starter drill index, uh, black oxide finished drill bits are, are not gonna be our first choice. While they work fine on mild steels, they just won't hold up against tougher steels or any type of nickel alloy or that kind of thing. Uh, not only that, they tend to gall up when run on aluminum, so, so definitely not our first choice. A TIN, titanium nitride coating, is going to give us a terrific value. It works well on different materials like steel, cast iron, aluminum, stainless, and more. And this coating allows us to run the tool faster without it melting, and it gives us many times the tool life of a plain or black oxide high-speed drill bit. I would rather have this than this. Now these are high-speed cobalt CO8 drill bits, uh, which are the same as an M42 tool steel. They have 8% cobalt in them. The cobalt isn't a coating, it's added into the steel for better thermal stability, strength, and tool life. HSS is a standard high-speed steel, which really isn't high-speed by today's standards. While an HSS tool may be able to handle 400 degrees Celsius, 
The addition of cobalt will raise the temperature a tool can withstand above 600 degrees Celsius. It can handle the heat. Not only that, but the, the TIN coating gives us better lubricity, so aluminum's not gonna stick to our tool. A cheaper drill bit might be fine for a hand drill, but for a CNC machine, we need a better bit, something that's gonna run true. We can check the straightness of a drill bit by rolling it across a flat granite block. Now we can see that this hardware store bit, it's just not straight compared to a quality drill. For general CNC work, I'd rather have a 135 degree tip angle drill than the 118 degree drills we used to use. They perform better on steels, they're less likely to walk on us, they enter and exit the material more easily, and this adds up to more accurate holes with fewer burrs. We call these drill indexes because they keep all of our drills in alphanumeric order so we can find them quickly, like an index at the back of one of our manuals helps us find what we need. This kit includes our full fractional number and letter drill indexes, along with backups for our most used sizes, like those diameters we will be using as tap drills. Having so many drill bits available to us creates a good problem. How are we supposed to get a hold of all these tools? Each one of these shanks has a different size. As far as tool holders go, an ER collet chuck offers us a lot of value. With a collet swap, a single holder can accommodate an endless number of uniquely sized drills, taps, reams, end mills, chamfer tools, spot drills, and engraving tools. But for holding all these different jobber length drill bits, twist drills, you just can't beat a keyless drill chuck. Very practical. And remember, use a tool vise to tighten up those tools. Don't use your spindle while tightening up things. In total, we have kicked off our list with 18 tool holders, the majority of which are ER collet chucks. One mistake we often see when tooling up a new machine is that folks will often buy the longest tool holders they can possibly find in case they might need that extra reach someday. This is a bad idea. The shorter the holder, the more stable it is and the less prone it is to chatter. So we are getting mostly short holders, two and a half inch gauge length with just one longer four inch holder in each collet size. And remember, the whole point of this kit, of our list, is to get you making parts with just about everything you need on your first day. So we're starting us off with five of the ER32s, three ER25, and three ER16. The numbers are the diameter of the collets, the holders, in millimeters. Now all of these holders are ready to run with pull studs and the wrenches we will need to change out our tools. The tool vise that is mounted on our machine works really well and it's convenient. Now for an easier time changing out tools at our bench, we've packaged in a Haas CT40 tool holder vise. We've put it on the list. Two tips that we have for you when dealing with ER collets. Uh, number one, we wanna keep our collet and our tool holder clean and dry. And number two, use the right size collets. All of these collets have a one millimeter range to them. And in general, we don't wanna load a tool with a diameter larger than the number written on the collet. If the collet says 12 millimeter, we can run a tool between 11 and 12 millimeters. And if we are running a half inch end mill, which is 12.7 millimeters, we will use a 13 millimeter collet. To get us going, we are starting off with an 18 piece ER32 collet kit. That's gonna hold tools between three and 20 millimeters. A 15 piece ER25 kit, two through 16 millimeters, and a 10 piece ER16 collet set, one through 10 millimeter. Now on top of what comes in these sets, we added in a handful of our most used collets to make sure that we are covered, actually making parts. We have end mill holders as well for our indexables, our roughers, and some of our end mills. Now the benefit of a side lock holder is that the tool just will not be pulled out. It's locked into the weld and flat on our tool. There's one thing that I do with end mill holders, side lock holders, uh, that might be unique, I don't know. I think that more people do it than just me. But on tools that are being pushed into the holder, like a spot drill, all the force is axial going into the holder. I will go ahead and lock in my set screw, loosen it a little bit, and then force it down just a little bit up against the sidewall before tightening it. So the tool has nowhere to go. 
And if I'm using a, an end mill, a helical end mill with the spiraled flutes here, um, these tools really want to be pulled out of the holder when they're being pushed hard. So on these guys, I will drive in my set screw, then I will loosen the set screw a little bit. I'll pull the tool out a little bit until it makes contact with the set screw before tightening it. So that tool has absolutely nowhere to go being pulled out. Again, while this tool has nowhere to go being pushed in. Uh, let me know if I'm the only one doing this or if you're doing it also. There are something like 171 drill bits in our kit. Uh, you can check me on that if you want to, uh, I'm, I might be off. But with that many bits, there is no way we're gonna buy two complete sets of, of drill bits, one for steel and one for aluminum. It just would not be cost effective. So what we did is we found the best combination of tool material and coating that will work with all kinds of materials. With our face mills though, we're gonna split things up. Uh, we can run at much higher speeds and feeds if we specialize by material type. Now this three inch face mill is built for aluminum and can handle all of our facing and a lot of our shoulder milling on that material. The body is balanced to 16,000 RPM and we can run it at high speeds because our polished HN25A inserts are engineered specifically for aluminum. Excellent lubricity, perfect for aluminum. For steels and stainless steels, this positive octagon insert is gonna get the job done for us. The 45 degree lead angles on these inserts will keep our axial and radial cutting forces well balanced. And with eight cutting edges per insert, they're an economical choice. Cutting tough steels requires a specialist. Now I usually face with coolant for a better surface finish. But these HMP35 grade inserts can handle extremely high temperatures without breaking a sweat, even cutting dry. If we didn't have inserts that could handle these high temperatures, we'd have to run these face mills really slow, and we just can't have that. Now, have you ever really looked at your chips? Most of the heat from milling is pulled out with those chips, and we can generally tell how hot things are running based on their color. Now, these chips are running at maybe 480 to 530 degrees Fahrenheit, 250 to 275 Celsius. And we can tell this because the color is moving from brown to a purple on these chips. Now these inserts can handle all of that heat because they were built for it. We chose this face mill for medium and finish facing because all of our parts are gonna need semi-finish and finishing passes. So a positive, positive face mill works well. Now if you are doing nothing but heavy roughing on steel all day long, we have other face mills for you that you can get on top of this one. Mills with negative insert angles that are designed for that high impact cutting of steel. We have a couple boxes of inserts for each of these face mills, so between the two of them, we are prepared. There is no fat in this kit. We're gonna use everything that we put on our list. And have you gotten a feel for why we are choosing one tool coating over another? And even now, when we're going to talk about profiling and milling on a part, we're going to go with a divide and conquer approach. For ferrous materials, materials with iron in them, we have a small assortment of high-end workhorse carbide end mills that we chose to make short work of steels, stainless, cast iron, tool steels, and even super alloys. Tough materials can kill tools, cooking them with their high heat. And this is where our aluminum chromium nitride coatings go to work for us. They can handle that high heat. Remember the volcano? That's right, 1100 degrees Celsius. And these tools can handle that without breaking a sweat. To further protect these tools from abuse, we chose 30 thou corner radius. And these tools would be much less likely to chip a corner on us than a perfectly sharp cornered tool. On most materials, these ALCRN end mills are a step up from TIALN coatings. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of TIALN coatings, uh, but these ALCRN coatings are harder than TIALN and can actually handle a higher heat. We have also added in half inch, three eighths and quarter inch performance uncoated end mills for aluminum. Now I chose these end mills specifically for their ideal lengths of cut to make sure that they would work for us on the greatest number of parts. To fill out our milling capabilities, we have dropped in a one inch indexable end mill that can be used to face, slot, ramp, and shoulder mill 
the parts that we don't want to be wasting our nice solid carbide end mills on. Uh, each insert has three cutting edges and we have included both HU30 and HN25A grade inserts. So we can use the same tool to cover both our ferrous and non-ferrous materials. Indexable tools are predictable and long lasting and the price of an insert, especially ones with multiple edges, can be much cheaper than a solid carbide alternative. Everything on our list in our kit is about performance, versatility, and value. Now for spot drilling, these high speed steel cobalt tools are really effective. What these spot drills offer us is a sharp, clean cutting tool that is great for spot drilling or coming in after a hole has been drilled and quickly chamfering it. Now we have put several sizes on our list, even a quarter inch spot for when we need to get close to a wall. Now for spot drilling and chamfering on larger holes or on tougher material, it's good for us to have an indexable spot drill. Now when the need arises, you will be thankful that we put this on our list. This indexable multi-tool will help us get through those tough jobs. Now we say multi-tool because this indexable spot drill can pull double duty as an indexable chamfer mill. With our G82 spot drilling cycles, we typically only need between 15 and 300 milliseconds of dwell time to get a full one or two revolutions of dwell. Uh, if we're dwelling that tool in that cycle for one or two full seconds, we might be getting 30 revolutions of dwell, which could be causing our tool to rub against the material instead of cutting. Now our parts are not finished until they are deburred, and deburring is an art. For heavy chamfers, we need large chamfer tools, and for chamfers that hug walls, we will need smaller chamfer tools, so we have included both in our kit. And just like you would expect, we are going to choose our chamfer tools based on their geometry, the number of flutes, and again, their tool coatings. Now we have a two flute TICN coated chamfering tool and a four flute TIALN coated chamfer. Now this TIALN coating is superb on steels with really good hardness, great thermal stability, but just okay lubricity. Now we could use this tool on aluminum and I've done it, but aluminum tends to stick to coatings with aluminum in their names, titanium aluminum nitride. Now there are better options out there when running on softer materials. For chamfering on aluminum, brass, plastic, even abrasive materials, we might go with a titanium carbonitride coating, TICN. Now this coating is super hard. It can hold a very sharp edge, which we need for clean chamfers and it has terrific lubricity. Now we can run these on steels, but there's a catch. TICN would be the perfect coating, except that at super high temperatures, it loses its thermal stability. And that super hard coating can soften up on us. Now we can use a TICN tool on steels. They work great, they're nice and hard, but they don't have the thermal stability that a TIALN has. So if we know that we're gonna be getting the tool hot, we should be running a TICN tool with coolant. Uh, chamfers don't generate a lot of heat in the first place, so TICN is gonna be fine on, on almost everything. And again, if we know we're burying these tools on hard materials, getting them hot, you should be using the TIALN over the TICN. We will take this same approach with our engraving tools. We've chosen a 31 thou radius, two flute engraving tool with TIALN coating for engraving on steels. Now the large tool radius, along with that TIALN coating, will give this tool super strength and super longevity. For aluminum and softer materials, uh, we've included this uncoated double-ended single flute engraving tool. And I'll mention this right now also, that if you really get into a pinch, you can grab the small quarter inch diameter spot drill that we showed you earlier, and you can use that as an engraving tool just to get you through a particular job. With all of these tool choices, we're seeing that we might choose a TIALN or an ALCRN coating when running on steels. Uh, or with our inserts, we might go with a, an HU30 or HMP35 grade. Uh, it's a multi-layered coating that can also handle the harder materials, the steels. And for running on aluminum, we're gonna be going with an uncoated, a bright tool, maybe a TICN or a TIN coating that's got a little bit higher lubricity. And for these last few tools that are on our tables, 
we are again heavily influenced by our tool coding choices. We have a couple roughers here that we're putting on the list if only as an insurance policy uh, against tough jobs. These roughers are just too inexpensive not to make available in our kit. HSSCO8, that's high speed steel cobalt at 8% cobalt. Uh, and these have a TIALN coating on them on top of that. Now, this allows these tools to punch way above their weight class. And remember, putting that coating on these tools is basically like putting a fireproof suit on them. It's going to give them incredible strength and longevity, great thermal stability. Now, I tend to reach for a solid carbide end mill first these days for steels. But a high-speed cobalt tool like this can really help us if we are chipping end mills. These cobalt end mills hold up pretty well, and, and the cobalt is less brittle than carbide, again, if we're experiencing chipping. There are also times when, when roughing a pocket where the chips just get in our way with a standard end mill. Those can pack in there like straws in a box, no matter how much coolant we pump at them. By going with a roughing end mill, we are, we are making those chips incredibly small and they can just be flushed out of that pocket using air or coolant much more easily. Another style of tool that we will definitely want in our toolbox are these ball nose end mills. Now we will need these when we create 3D surfaces but they can also be used to create angled chamfers and other 2D features without having to create an entirely new setup. Now we want to keep this kit lean so we have added only a single ball nose each for aluminum and ferrous metals. One two flute uncoated for aluminum and one four flute with an ALCRN coating. And of course, we have a full lineup that you can check out on the website. Another tool to get us started are these solid carbide reamers. Now we don't know what size you would use on your production parts. So we put in just one set that can be used for both slip fit and the press fit of a quarter inch dowel pin. Now, if you need to make a fixture or a precision hole of, of any kind, really, this is a tool that we will use to get it done. They give us a great tolerance on the, on the whole diameter with beautiful surface finishes. And they're fast. They're much faster than using a, a single flute boring bar. These are six flute, so we can increase our feed rates, which is perfect for production. And even on prototype work, they're just easy to use. And we know that with all the drill that's available to us in this kit, that we're going to find the perfect size drill to pre-drill for these reamed holes. But what size do we use? 2% max 5%. That is our rule of thumb when deciding what size drill to use with any particular size reamer. Uh, when I'm reaming a hole on steel, we want our drill to be 2% smaller than our final reamer diameter. And when reaming a hole in aluminum, we want our pre-drilled hole about 3% smaller than our final ream diameter. And in all cases, we don't want to leave more than 5% of our diameter uh, in stock for our reamer to remove. Otherwise, we could get ourselves into trouble. We can look on our drill chart and see all the sizes that are available just smaller than quarter inch that we might be able to use. A letter D drill is 0.246 inches in diameter, which would leave us 1% of stock to remove. Now this isn't enough. Our tool might just rub instead of cutting, which will cause the reamer to wear out quickly. A letter C drill, 0.242 inches, is gonna leave us about 3% of stock left to remove by our reamer. And that sounds just about right. This kit comes with a lot of drill bits to get us started, and we will need them. For our tap drill sizes, we have added extras to make sure that we don't run out. And so we don't get stuck using an old worn out bit for pre-drilling tapped holes. A dull drill bit will take more power to cut and create more heat in that cut, which can work hard in our material, causing us tapping problems. We want a strong material that can hold a sharp edge to make our taps out of. To give our taps extra protection and a better hot hardness, we have added a TICN coating. Now this hard coating will reduce wear, keeping our taps sharp for longer. This is a starter kit. And so to cover all of our bases, we've selected our multi-material taps. Now these are good on just about every material out there. And we've made a, a pretty good selection of both fine pitch and coarse pitch taps uh, in imperial sizes. 
And for each of these thread sizes, we have dropped in both a spiral flute bottoming tab, which will pull the chips out of the hole for us, perfect for blind holes, and a spiral point plug tab, which is an ideal choice for tapping through holes with its moderate chamfer and thick cord that will give us a long tool life. And for our metric friends, we are making more and more metric tools available each and every week, so keep checking the website. And as those kits are made available, we will add those links to the description of this video. Choosing the right tap is important, but just as important as selecting the right style and coating for a tool is making sure that we have the right amount of coolant concentration. If our coolant concentration isn't right, not much else matters. We will end up with bad surface finishes, rusty parts, and broken taps. The tool that we use to measure our coolant concentration is a simple but amazing work of science. Now it's called a refractometer and it can tell us what our coolant concentration is by measuring the amount that the light will bend as it passes through a small sample of our coolant. That's right, light bends. As a beam of light moves from one medium to another, it changes speed, which changes its direction. Now, how much the light bends as it enters and exits a transparent material is known as that material's refractive index. The more concentrated our coolant, the more our light will bend. The concentration of our coolant will change the readings on our refractometers, but so will the temperature in the room. That's why we want to choose a refractometer that has automatic temperature compensation. If our coolant concentration drops below about 4%, we will start to see rust problems on our parts and our machine. This is super, super important. Our coolant concentration affects our surface finishes and our tool life and, and rust problems and all kinds of things. In fact, if our coolant concentration is too low, it affects the pH balance of our coolant tank which can cause bacteria and fungus problems, which we do not want to see. So it's important that we have a refractometer available and we use it as soon as we fill up that tank for the first time. As machinists, we will hold our material in a vise if we can. Now I've used this particular vise for years and can recommend it because it's easy to set up and maintain. It's got high clamping forces and excellent repeatability. And that's the important part. It has to hold the part well and not move on us. Now this clamp set will have everything that we need to hold our vise, our parts and our fixtures to our table. For some setups, we'll use the step blocks and these strap clamps. Now remember to always keep the heel of your strap clamps slightly higher than the toe. Now we could have gone with a vise that has ground edges that allow the vise to be placed on its side in the machine. And those are terrific and we might need one of those one day. But for my everyday vise, I just like the models that have a simple flange on them. They're easy to set up and use and uh, that makes a difference in a job shop especially. Now we won't need any step blocks or strap clamps to mount this vise. Just a couple of studs and nuts and we are done. I also like this style if I'm mounting multiple vices. They can be nested right next to each other. And with these cutouts, we can reach the nuts with a socket from the top. Now, have you seen this part stop? It's built right into the vise and mounts right onto our ground hard jaw. Now, along with precision hard jaws that come with our vise, we will need some machinable steel and aluminum soft jaws, so we have put those on our list. Soft jaws are a must have. To set up our vise, we used our Haas indicator held in a mag base, a magnetic indicator base, while we could have also held the indicator in our keyless drill chuck. Our indicator can also be used to help find the center of a hole or measure the height difference between surfaces. Along with the precision dial indicator, we have filled this kit with the inspection tools we absolutely know that we will make use of. Micrometers for high precision measurements, Calipers for, for quickly measuring OD, ID, shoulders, and depths, uh, with or without a base attachment. A steel rule with both inch and metric markings, and one, two, three blocks. These are steel blocks ground to precisely one inch by two inch by three inch, and used by machinists for just about any task a perfectly square, precise piece is needed. They can be used for inspection if calibrated and kept clean, but we normally use them as precision spacers for setups for cutting jaws, or just as square material for setups. 
These are the tools of our trade. Now for the full list, check out the link in the description and make sure you comment. Let us know what you think we got right and what tools you think we are lacking that you just could not do your job without. Thanks for letting us be a part of your success and for watching this Haas Tip of the Day.